Hello and welcome to another edition of What Does the Giraffe Say Media with me, Kathleen Rotorno. We're an organisation that aims to connect people in conservation by holding live interviews on social media. Today, I am very happy to be joined by Dave Webb, and he is the founder of UK Wild Otter Trust. So, Dave, I'm going to hand over to you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is about otters that drew you to them? Yeah, hi, Catherine. Um, yeah, I mean, otters. I mean, we, we. I first saw an otter when I was really small, when I was, when I was a kid, um, which clearly looking at me is a long time ago, um, <laughs> and. I didn't really know what it was, so I started looking, f trying to find out more about them and what it, what they were doing, and why why I saw it, where I saw it, um, and then I, I sort of as I as I came out of that, um, I went more into working with lots of different deer species in the UK, and then when we moved to Devon, we saw uh, the wife and myself, we saw a mum and a cub in a very very small. Um, brook running up through a woodland and that sort of re-sparked it so i set about um finding out as much as i possibly could um, about these animals and one thing that i learned very quickly was that there is no such thing as an expert in otters right because you learn every day so i can go down to the, the rehab pens this morning and see them do something that they haven't done never seen them done before going in again this afternoon to do something completely different so they're totally unpredictable they're extremely mysterious um but they're a great learning tool particularly in terms of conservation in, in their needs and how they're released and how they're reared and how they live in the wild and if you can get all that information you can actually do a good job in in what we do and what other people do in in rehab and getting them back to the wild and that that's that's the attraction to me and so you touched on it a little bit there about them being so important to the ecosystem. What is it that is so important? What do they bring to the system that, that is important to uphold? Um, well, it, they're an apex predator, um, as, as most people know. Um, and you, you obviously have to have within, and I'm talking about within the animal world now, you have to have a um, apex predator in order to keep everything below that in the food chain, in in the habitat and, and the everything else, um, you have to keep that in check. It has to be managed and controlled. Uh, we can't do that as humans, not effectively. We've already seen what a mess we've made of trying to do that, and it, it doesn't work. Um, apex predators can do it. They do it very well. And if you were to remove the apex predators, you didn't have them, everything below it would suffer genetically, health-wise. Um, that's why it's so vital that we have that animal or that species at the top of the food chain, and that's where it's to at the moment. So, you know, it's all good. I think that's things that people don't realise, isn't it? Because humans have messed around with the ecosystems and the, the animals that are in there, and if you do take the apex predator out, then that mm. means you're going to get an influx of what would have been its prey, and then mm. that's going to then decimate what they were eating, and then it kind of, the scale kind of goes from there, right? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's a tumble effect, you know, and, and we do lots of work with angling, again, we'll touch on that later, I'm sure, but, um, you know, the biggest mistake, as I see it, is that people try to manage the habitat, the habitat, the riparian habitats and things like that from the top down, we shouldn't, we should be looking at the bottom up, because yeah. all the main problems are on the bottom, not at the top, yeah. so the apex predators aren't causing the problem, they're helping us solve it, providing we're starting at the top, you know, or, providing we're starting at the bottom and go, you know, working up to where they are. Um, if you're trying to remove apex predators and go the other way down, it's a disaster. It doesn't work. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so you, you mentioned a little bit there. So what are the threats that we are seeing to otters? Um, what's their, are they endangered? What's their status? Um, and kind of what, what's the impact here? Um, well, they're listed on the OUCN um groups they um they're, they're listed as near threatened um now they are thought to be in every county in the uk that's only, they only say that because they've done sprint surveys no sprint surveys are not reliable that geographically they're okay um but if you've got two counties together at devon and cornwall for example i live you know i live probably 20 miles from the cornish border but in devon and otters males have a territory of up to 20 miles 
sometimes more. So it would be very easy for an otter close to the border this side, go to Cornwall, sprint, and then come back. And then the sprint in Cornwall counted, when in actual fact there may not be one there, yeah. but it's counted as one because it's had a sprint there. So so they're not reliable in that in that source. Um and the, the main threats to them at the moment is the biggest killer is road traffic accidents. Um, there's a lot of more road infrastructure around than there used to be you know, back you know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, and we do still sadly see some persecution, illegal persecution, um, shooting, trapping, drowning, um, snares, nets, you name it, we see it um and again that's another story that would take up you know three shows probably if i started talking about it too much but you know the, the main threat is traffic road traffic accidents and so aside from the road traffic accidents you're saying about them being um you know essentially hunted um why is that what is the reason behind that um it's it's generally from um fisheries or river keeper now you cannot fence a river to protect it that's quite obvious and it's quite obvious why i feel for those guys the lakes most can be fenced but not all um and sometimes people just can't be bothered to fence because they don't see that it's necessary to do that they would rather take the chance um and it's content you know we know otters cause problems if they get into a fishery you know their main diet 75 percent ish relies on fish and if they stumble across a lake full of fish that's unfenced it's like us walking into a bank with no locks on it on the, on the safes you know you're going to help yourself you're going to feed and you're going to go off and you're going to go back and try your luck again um and you know whilst we see we know that that's conscientious you know contentious um we have to work with nature not against it yeah, I completely agree. And then, so a lot of the work that you do as well is working with otters that have been found and you're rescuing them. Mm -hmm. What's the rehabilitation process? What What are you doing? And how do you teach an otter to be an otter? Um, well, it, I mean, obviously an otter already. They just don't know it. <laughs> so... The, the, the rehab process takes anything up to a year, sometimes longer, depending on the individual animals, because um, everyone is, di is different. Um, and it depends what size they are. I mean, we, we have them in, you know, we've had them in as the smallest we've had in something like 460 grams in weight. Um, and we've had them in at six, seven, eight kilos in weight. And they all need different different types of care. They're all in for different periods. Um, but the, the process is um, the smaller ones, they, they start off with um, a very small saucer of, of water, food in the same place, same times, um, and then gradually it gets moved around a little bit. The water, bar, uh, the water containers get slightly bigger, so once they're in there having a drink or they're sitting in it, then we move it into a slightly bigger one so that they can get in. They can't swim in it, but they can get in it. It's a little bit deeper, so that, so the sensation to them is all very different, and we're moving the food all the time, keep moving it to the point um, where getting close to a year down the line, they're then in a full-size bath because they're you know, as the, the bath sizes progress, they do learn to swim. They can swim naturally. Um, you know, they just need the encouragement to do it. So we do it gradually. And the same with the food. Um, every time we keep moving it, we then change times that we feed. We change how we feed, where we feed. We hide it under rocks. We put it in pipes, put it in bushes, hang it in trees, just to make them um, – they basically have to work for it. They have to go yeah. look for it and find it, and that's teaching them to hunt. Um, but whilst we're doing that, it's a very, very – and I can't stress it enough, a very, very hands-off process. So we're not going in there calling them or talking to them every 10 minutes. We we go in um, periodically to health check them, quick visual health check and weigh them. So we, we, we visually check them whilst we weigh them. Um, smaller cubs are done once a week. And the bigger ones are done once a month. Um, and that way we get a good gauge that they're putting on weight or staying stable weight wise. Um, we can see how they, how they look, how the coat looks, how they behave. Um, 
but all the time it's a very very hands-off process so feeding um once they get to the bigger stage in size it's literally a case of apart from the the, the periodic check it is literally a case of food over the top you don't even go in the, in the enclosure yeah that completely makes sense we have a question coming through from winnie hi winnie She's a regular watcher of the show and actually got us to, to connect in the first place. So lovely to see her. Um, and she's asking, is it possible for Otter Road signs to be shown on UK roads? Um, I've had lots of conversations with various councils about this. Um, hi, Winnie. Um, and their issue is that if they put a road sign up or if we put a road sign up because i offered to do it um they then have the responsibility because it's on the public road to maintain it that's then giving them extra work and extra cost and it's putting their guys in more danger than what they are already um so then they're, they're very very um anti putting road signs up however there is one road sign in cornwall but that's sited on private land. Now, they do this in Scotland, um, particularly on the Isle of Mull um, and, and probably Sky as well, um, where obviously there's lots of otters up there going around, you know, crossing the roads because, because of the terrain. Um, but they site the, put the signs on private land um, because then the council can't do anything about it. And if we can find land, private land, that's right next to the road, which is quite difficult in the UK, um, then that's what we would do. I don't think personally i don't think traditionally road signs people tend to look at them a lot um and i did comment once i, I spoke to the council actually in wales um about this i said well, yeah, but you put side road signs up for toads yeah across, and we see them down here as well yeah. um, and the reason they did that they told me um is because toads if they're crossing it on mass in you know, big groups it presents a skid risk right um which sort of sounded a daft answer, but actually when you think about it, it's not. Yeah. Um, but otters, they don't see that as a significant risk of death to humans within vehicles. Um, so, you know, so they don't. And uh, I see a sign there saying there's a road sign in Limington Hans. It's one of the very, very few. I know where that sign is. Um, it's one of the very, very few in the UK. Mm -hmm. And then we have a question coming through from uh, Marianne. Hi, lovely to see you as well. Um, and she's saying, can, are you open to working with other organisations in different countries? So, for example, she's based in the Netherlands and they're starting to reintroduce a lot of otters back. Um, so she's wondering if there's a chance for then collaborations of people sharing information and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I mean, certainly in terms of um advice and help like that we we're always up for doing that um that's what makes the otter world tick um there is another group the iosf the international water survival fund run by paul and grace up on the other sky and they um they do lots and lots of work all over the world with different species of otters um and there is a guy in the netherlands um Adi dijon who who also does quite a lot of work there. Um, if you look Addy up, he would probably be the better one there to, to speak to about that. And then we have another comment again from the, ne the Netherlands as well. Um, and that's from Cora. Hi, Cora. And they're saying in the Netherlands, they've built otter passages and pipes and other ways to prevent them from being having to cross a road. Is this something that we can look into in the UK? Yeah, um, again, there is a few um they, they, this method is used quite often particularly where roads are new, new infrastructure is being built um they're doing a, a upgrade to a local um main link road near us at the moment um and they are talking of doing this putting some sort of under pipes underneath um yeah that's a great way of mitigating them crossing the road yeah. it won't always work yeah. but it certainly helps but yes it is being looked at you know, looked into in the uk and then also when you're looking at when you've rehabilitated these otters and then you're looking at them putting them back out into the wild, are these the factors that you kind of take into consideration, like what the roads are like around that way? How do you decide where to them relocate them? Um, we always pick our site. So there's no one set broad spectrum um, in terms of site for every single otter because every single otter, as, as we see it, needs different things um so we always pick our sites very carefully and try and 
match the A site with the Otter that's going to be going out. Um, but you know, people say to me, you know, you shouldn't release near fisheries. Well, an otter's got a 20 mile habit, you know, radius, you know, territorial habitat patch if you wish a male. You know, certainly where I live, it would be impossible not to yeah. release near a fishery because there's a lot of fisheries around here. Yeah. There's some parts of the country there isn't, um, but we do our best, um, our, our absolute best to ensure that when they go out, you know, it's in the most secluded spot possible. Um, and that's purely for the auto safety. Um, yeah. You know, it's about keeping them safe. It gives them a good, good, um, good grounding. It gives them somewhere safe to hold up for, for a few months in some cases. Um, and then gradually they will just naturally explore anyway um, and hope that they don't, you know, come across the main road because at some point they, they, they will. Um, but we, we do our utmost to try and keep everything away from, from roads, fisheries, housing states, and places like that. So the places we use are extremely, extremely secluded. And are there areas in the UK that you have more kind of populating um, of otters? Is there a certain, you know, like counties or whatever that they prefer? Or, or is it just they're, they're happy wherever they are? Um, they, they, I mean, from our post-monitoring, they seem happy enough from, you know, from where they are. Um, as long as they've got access to, to a reasonable food source, they've got water, um, you know, good dense habitat, um, they seem happy. We, we've not ever had any problems with all the ones that we've released. It's, it's been, you know, last year was extremely busy um, and we've post-monitored all of them. Some are still being post-monitored um, and they all seem fine, all absolutely fine. And also, kind of on you're talking about monitoring them there, and I know there's a lot of people back home that are watching from other areas which may have otters. If you're like a novice and wanted to go and spot an otter, you said I think right at the start that they're, they're quite an elusive animal. Um, what advice would you give them to kind of take up otter spotting? Um, well, the first thing, um, if if you've got a, a river near you, um, is go out and do your homework on the river. The first thing to look for, forget about finding the actual animal, go out and look for signs. So you can look for footprints, slides down into the river, um, scraping. So it's, it's, it's what they call castling. It is as though they've sort of scraped a load of um, dirt up. The spring, you can find that um, quite distinctive. And then once you've found that, you can put some cameras out. You know, If you've got permission to be on the land, you can put some cameras out on those spots and see what you get and once you've found that you can then over a period of time you'll get a good picture of their movements and and how they behave how they work how where they're moving to times and stuff like that and then if you sit in the right spot you sit quiet um always sit downwind of them don't sit upwind of them um and you know eventually that hard work you'll, you'll be rewarded and it makes it so much worth you know worthwhile as well because you've actually taken the effort to to find the signs and then you see that otter and it, when you see your first one it's something you won't forget i can guarantee it i mean they make you work for it right <laughs> if you want to see one definitely. you have to work for it um, yeah is, definitely is there a particular time of day what what's is there i, I don't know like any kind of like weather conditions or anything like that um it probably varies through the uk um down here, it tends not to make that much difference. I mean, I've seen them in, in all times of day. I've seen them in all weathers. Um, and everything an otter does is driven by food. If the food supply is not there, you ain't going to see one. It's as simple as that. Um, so, you know, most of the rivers down here, we're lucky because they're they're um, some of the main game fishing rivers. So they've got salmon, they've got eels, they've got trout, they've got grayling. So we know there's good food supplies in those in those rivers. Um, and, and incidentally, the, 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 the catch rate or the catch records for those fish, for the fishermen, <coughs> excuse me, is actually going up year on year, even though they've got otters. So it just shows how an apex predator can actually benefit the species below them. Um, but no, there isn't. I mean, I've, I can see them any day. People say early morning, last thing at night, dusk, we, we see them at you know, any time, but you know, it, it's potluck, it really is. They spend probably 70% of the day asleep. So <laughs> it's 
it narrows the day down a little bit. It's just picking the right hour but when, you, when you go out and see them. <laughs> and I know when, um, I mean, even before we, where we before we went live, we had a phone call to say that there was a, a an otter that needed um, to be looked after. Mm -hmm. Typically, how do you find out about these animals? And if someone does come across a live otter or, or cub that needs help, what should they do? Um, well, they, they can ring us. Um, yeah, literally, as I was about to come on air, we had another call um, from somebody in um, Lincolnshire um, who's just found a small cub. Um, it's been there for a while, crying. Um, they've now picked it up um, after monitoring it for a few hours. Now, we always say to people, if they ring us and say there's a cub there, we say, as long as they haven't touched it or picked it up, we say monitor it for 24 hours because quite often the mum will leave it for a considerable time and then go back for it. If it's still there in 24 hours, ring us and we'll do something. Um, this one had been there not for 24 hours, but for a considerable time. And it's out in daylight, which is, you know, sort of unusual up, up there. Um, so, anyway, so they've picked it up. Um, that's now going to be diverted to one of the local wildlife um, hospitals that we work with. Um, so the best thing, if you see one, find one, don't touch it immediately, ring us, we'll ask you some questions, you can give us the information and then we'll make that call. Um, because it's really, really important for the otter that it's not just taken to any old rescue centre, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Really? There are very few places in the UK that actually know or have worked with otter cubs, and they need specialist care. The first 24, 48 hours, if they get the wrong care, it will kill them. Simple as that. So you've got to give them the best chance. Um, so ring us. We've got a nationwide network of hospitals that we use. Virtually every county in the country is covered. And we can get that diverted to the right place within a good time and you know give it the best possible chance before it comes down to us and are they dangerous to humans say so one was injured would you be at risk if you did touch it for example uh yeah you'd probably use your fingers um yeah um it's, it's a natural thing if they're injured and you try and get near it um it's still you know providing it's not concussed or anything like that um it's quite possible. They're still very, very capable of giving you a nasty nip, even the smaller ones. Um, so you have to be extremely careful. It's not just a case, not like dealing with anything else like a fox or anything like that. They're very, very different and are capable of inflicting some very, very nasty wounds. Um, so, yeah, it's a natural defense. If they're injured, you know, and you try and get near it, they are going to defend themselves. They don't know you're trying to help it. Um, and the smaller cubs, when they're really, really small, um, you can quite often you can get out of those and pick them up because they're you know they're dehydrated or you know really really cold really really tired um you know the rule of thumb is if you can walk up to it it needs help it's as simple right. as that okay that's good advice thank you for sharing that we've got a question coming through from cheryl and she's saying why are otters now traveling through very shallow brooks instead of canals and rivers she had one near her and there was not much food around and unfortunately it was hit and killed by a car in a built up area. Yeah, and we see this a lot. Um, you have to remember that a natural habitat for an otter is a river. The natural habitat for an otter isn't a canal. Um, and very generally, if, if it's accessing the canal via a river or of some sort, somehow, um, they normally leave the rivers when they're in flood. So when the rivers are in raging torrent, as they are down here sometimes, everything an otter does is um, maximum return for minimum effort. So they're not going to swim in a very, very strong flowing river, flooded river, particularly if they've got cubs. They will move them into the smaller, shallower, slower waters like canals and small brooks um, and look for food, even though there's not much food in the one that, that Cheryl's mentioning there. Um, and sadly, that's how, as I said before, that some are hit by cars and killed. And then we have another question coming through from Leslie. Hey, Leslie, lovely to see you. Um, she's based in South Florida um, and she's asking, are they naturally aggressive? She saw four and when they got in the water, when she was looking at them, they were hissing at us. Do alligators eat them? They're both in the same canal. Um, 
That's a good question. I, I, I actually don't know the answer to them, whether an alligator would take them. Um, I know certainly the um, the giant otters, they hunt in packs. Um, and the, um, alligator or caiman is their main prey. So, so they're quite formidable. Um, I suspect they would probably keep their distance. Um, but yes, they are naturally aggressive. Um, that's how they survive. That's why they're an apex predator. I get hissed at every day. You know, it's, and it's not just by the otters, mainly by the volunteers we got as well. <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> well, that's the thing, isn't it? They don't know you're trying to help, so they're just well, doing their natural thing. Yeah, um, you talk about the volunteers now with the otters again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could be both, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have another question coming through from Andrew, and she's asking if it's unusual to see otters near narrowboats on marinas on the canal network. No, it's not. Um Otters are extremely inquisitive, and and we again we get lots of calls um, from people saying, oh, you know, we've just gone down to our boat mooring and there's an otter asleep on the back of it or, or climbed up in it. Um, they're, they're naturally inquisitive; they get up on there, and and if it's comfortable, they go to sleep. Um, so no, it's not unusual at all. And um, a lot of what you do as well is you do a lot of um, education work as well with the, mm -hmm. the students and and uh, people around the UK. Can you talk to us a little bit about the education that you've been doing um, and is there any kind of projects that work best and what what changes in attitude you've been seeing? Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the biggest issue with, um, it, it, sorry, the, the reason we, we do the education stuff um, is we have to raise awareness about the species, we have to raise awareness about, about the threats we have to raise awareness why it's important to to reduce all that, um, and and particularly with the angling fraternity, we do we do lots and lots of work with with the angling fraternity in terms of fence advice, um, lots of myths out there. You know, they, you know things like you know, they, they breed like rabbits. They have you know ten young a year, and, and but, but a lot of it is all rubbish, um, and. It, it's getting that information out there. If people can better understand what makes that otter tick, the better is they can use it to to protect their fishery in particular. Um, but generally, the, the 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 public's perception of an otter is that they're oh, you know, lovely, cute, and cuddly. They're not, and it's important to say that because they're not. They do look it. Yeah, and like, you know, photographs are probably the worst thing in the world to 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 make it look as though they are. And I'm guilty of taking photographs like that as well. Um, but you use it for education. You don't use it to promote the species as being something that's cute and cuddly because then more people are prone to go and try and pick one up, more prone to try and keep it, more prone to try and rehab it, and ultimately it kills it. Um, so raising the awareness about the complete species, about why we do what we do, how we do it, very, very important. And, and the public's attitude we've seen, certainly from the work that we've been doing, is that that's working and more people better understand the species and, and that's the goal. Yeah, no, that is the goal indeed. And if people are watching back home and they want to support the work you do, because obviously um, you're a charity so that you need, um, you, you survive on uh, donations. <laughs> uh, what's the best thing that people can do, like, as well as like volunteering or maybe helping on social media? What What would you suggest? Yeah, um, I mean, certainly any, anybody local, because we, we sort of live in... Um, the technical term down here, so it's sort of back end of our end of nowhere. Um, there's not a lot down here. Um, <laughs> so if there's local people um, that are watching and they want to pitch in and help, you know, things like painting, you know, building enclosures, feedings, all sorts, it can be done. Go to our website. Um, contact details are on there. There's also a donate button on there because obviously we are completely self-funded. It's important to say that that nobody within our team gets paid anything at all. Most are retired. Some are working. They have jobs, including myself. I've got a job. Um, so, you know, anything financially that people can give, um, obviously that helps us do the good work that we're, we're, we've been doing for years and that we're going to continue doing. And I completely agree. So if you're watching this back home, wherever you are, please do give this show a little like, comment and share. The more people that see it, the more awareness we can raise for the work that these people are doing. Um, and we've had some absolutely lovely comments as we've been chatting, Dave. Um, lots of people mm -hmm. 
Good. Very supportive of the work that you're doing. Um, so what are your future plans? What, what's, what's your hopes for the going forward? Um, re early retirement. <laughs> um, uh, we're, we're still building at the moment um, we found that demand down here has been excessive particularly this last year so we're still building enclosures um, you know we want this to be you know I, I want to leave this as a, as a legacy for otter conservation um, you know it's been no mean feat in getting getting what we've got here done um, you know, last year we touched close to 40 otters in, um, 35 released, um, busy, busy year. Um, very, very important to note though, none of that could be achieved without our volunteers. Um, and the volunteers are key. They are the core members. I'm just a fat kid from Cornwall that sits there and says, put that fence up. Um, and, but I keep out of the way because I'm useless with tools. Um, if it wasn't for the volunteers, we wouldn't have this organization and it's so important to say that and i know i take the mickey out of them and they take the mickey out of me more often than i do with them of course um but it's really really important to know how key and vital those people are to organizations like this that don't pay anybody a penny for doing any of it they do it because they want to be there they do it because they want to do it and that's admirable you know top guys a lot and, and women of course don't be sexist but everybody fantastic people uh, okay, so well, I've only got one more question left. If you're watching back home and you would like to put a question towards Dave, then please just pop it in the comments section and I will do exactly that for you. Um, I always like to finish things on a positive note. Uh, conservation can get a little bit bleak at times and it's nice to know that there is hope out there. Um, so I'd like to know what your favourite success story was. Mm, um, I think mine really is... Um... In 2019, we had um, a report of from people staying on a campsite in Dorset um, saying that, that a guy had uh, shot an otter. And we all know how very difficult in the UK it is to get prosecutions into court um, for this sort of thing. Um, it took a year to a year and a half to get, to get everything, get all the evidence together. But we got him into court. Um, first court case of its kind ever um, in the UK and he was sent to prison given a hefty fine lost his firearm certificate lost his business which was worth a lot of a lot of money over a couple of million um, he lost everything um, it's sad that it had to get to that but that was a big, big step forward for us in terms of getting that into court um, because it just showed what the true angling fraternity, the real anglers thought of that. They were disgusted and it built, helped us build massive bridges. So that's probably the biggest success story in getting somebody sent to prison. And it sounds a bit, you know, but it happened. Um, it wasn't our fault, it was his. So, you know, that, that was a good move. And I think as well, it shows to other people that that behaviour is not acceptable. You know, it sets a standard mm. and, and hopefully others will not then go down the same road. I'd like to think so. Um, I think certainly from, from the trend that we've seen, um, you know, it, it certainly got more people, more anglers, more fishery owners to engage with us. There's no question about that. Um, so, yeah, it did, it, you know, it, it, it did the species and the angling because there's always been a, a you know, <clears throat> uh, you know, us versus them um, mentality, which is just rubbish. Everybody has to work together. We all want the same thing. You know, it's not worth it. Um, and then we got Cheryl's coming back on, and she's asking. Um, she wanted a bit more clarity about why they're going into the into the shallow rivers. I mean, you touched on it earlier before that it it was a easier tra uh, traverse for them, um, even though there's no no food. Is that the case? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's quite often it's when <coughs> it's when the rivers are in flood or there's high water around or something's disturbed them, they will move away um, and they use the smaller lakes or, or uses the smaller waterways. Otters, in actual fact, even though they're, they're semi-aquatic, don't actually need a lot of water. They're quite happy 
covering large areas over land and they can do it quite quickly so it's not unusual to see them in areas where there isn't a lot of water or a lot of food they find food then they don't just eat fish they will eat fish eggs birds mammals i've even known them eat fruit and blackberries and things like that um so they're, they're very adaptable um and that's why they survive Excellent. Thank you so much, Dave, for coming on. We've had, as I say, a really nice, uh, really nice feedback coming through. Thank you, everyone back home for watching and for putting your questions to us as well. Really appreciate it. Um, is there anything you'd like to finish with before we say goodbye? Mate, no, just thanks for, for the opportunity to, to be on here. Um, really a little bit more, you know, a lot more um, awareness raised. Great stuff, you know, and I hope everybody's enjoyed the chat. So, yeah, look us up on the website. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. And I hope everyone's got a bit more of an understanding about these wonderful animals. And as he said, check them out on the website. Also go and check them out on Facebook as well. And you can follow them on social media. Um, as I say, anyone, any likes, comments and shares all go towards helping to raise awareness to people who may not be um, aware of what's actually happening with the otters. So thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for your lovely comments. And from me, enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers. All the best. <laughs>